Good evening. I am Christian Heyrich, and I would like to thank you for joining me this evening. Tonight we are going to ward off the ever-present evil spirit of temperance. A hundred years ago today, I stood in this room worried for the future of my family and my business. As I tried to understand what was about to befall my beloved city, I took a stroll through the bustling city streets towards the White House and found myself at the door of famed medium, Mrs. Varnicky. The fates had decided my path, and it was there that I met with the greatest spiritualist our city has ever known. This was not my first visit to the medium, for my third wife, Amelia, was a spiritualist and held spiritual beliefs throughout her lifetime. Spiritualism is a movement based on the belief that departed souls can interact with the living. Spiritual mediums have the ability to contact spirits directly. After our first daughter, Anna Marguerite's death, Amelia used spiritual mediums to try and reach our daughter. On October 31st, 1917, I sat with Mrs. Varnicky and asked her to speak to the spirits and tell me if prohibition would ever end. Would I ever be able to return to my beloved livelihood? She told me that I would like to see the end of prohibition in Washington, D.C. My brewery and family would survive this trying time, and that it would be forever in my power to ensure the spirits of temperance would remain at bay. She told me that on the hundredth anniversary of that night, I would be resurrected. <laughs> that, <laughs> that I should host a funeral for temperance in my mansion and perform certain rituals and sacrifices. Only by doing this would I be able to guarantee that prohibition would be gone from Washington, D.C. forever. <laughs> As we gather here today, I give up this bottle of Solidarity Beer, a symbol of Washington's modern beverage business, as a sacrifice to ensure our efforts here tonight are not in vain. Together we bury this bottle so that we may continue to live in a city unbound by the pressures of the temperance society. Please join me in prayer. <laughs> Bless, O barley lord, this creature beer which thou hast deigned to produce from the fat of grain, that it may be a salutary remedy to the human race and grant through the invocation of thy holy name that Whoever shall drink it may gain health in body and peace in soul. Ost. 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 I now invite Kathy Rizzo, Executive Director of the DC Brewers Guild, to speak. Thank you for joining us here today. I would like to share with you the words of the Shepherd Bone Dry Act. This act was signed into law on March 3, 1917 by President Woodrow Wilson. This woeful signature resulted in D.C. being deemed a dry city starting on November 1, 1917. As that day neared, the city began to sell off the last of its alcohol. What follows is a portion of this act for you. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that on and after the first day of November, 1917, no person or persons, directly or indirectly, shall, in the District of Columbia, manufacture for the sale or gift, import for the sale or gift, sell, offer for sale, keep for sale, traffic in, barter, export, ship out of the District of Columbia, or exchange for goods or merchandise, or solicit or receive orders for the purchase of any alcoholic or other prohibited liquors for beverage purposes or for any other than scientific, medicinal, <laughs> pharmaceutical, sacramental, or other non-beverage purposes. <laughs> While some saw it as a chance to make DC the model of a temperate city, it did not become one. 267 licensed bars and saloons closed on November 1st, 1917. From that, roughly 3,000 speakeasies opened. <laughs> Catering to customers with bootlegged alcohol, predominantly whiskey and gin. Unfortunately, very few bootleggers made beer, and DC shifted toward a cocktail town. 
When Prohibition ended in 1933, only two of the five breweries that existed in 1917 reopened. So today, we put to rest the Shepherd Bone Dry Act and its ideals. We call on the spirit of temperance to leave this city at peace. <laughs> I would now like to invite Jeffrey Hancock, co-owner of DC Bray, or as you might say, Growl in modern parlance, <laughs> up to chair the words. Welcome. <laughs> I have been called upon by Christian Heirich as a feller purveyor of beer. I create the drink that brings joyful barley and hops into your life. Today, as we lay rest the spirit of temperance, I'm reminded of the many ways in which beer has made the world great. <laughs> From the earliest days of beer in Iran, Egypt, and Mesopotamia, humans have seen its work. From a medicinal aid to a conversation starter, beer has been our ever faithful friend. <laughs> when Christian Heyrich closed his brewery in 1917, he could have chosen to retire. He was already 75 years old. Instead, he kept this brewery opening, open, turning it into an ice factory. When Prohibition ended in 1933, when Christian was a young 91 years old, he chose to reopen his brewery for the Herrick family. Beer was not simply a drink, it was a way of life. As we stand here today, I am reminded of the words of Christian Herrick from 1912. I, quote, am proud of my calling as much as the father of this country most likely was when he was running a distillery, or the immortal Abraham Lincoln when he applied for a liquor license. <laughs> the Christian Heinrich Brewing Company closed permanently in 1956. Not until 2011 would another production brewery open in the city with the founding of, with the founding of D.C. Brown. Today, I carry on the tradition of Christian Heinrich and do my part to keep temperance out of this fair city. I would now like to bring up George Cassidy to say a few choice words. Good evening. I am George Cassidy. For 10 years, between 1920 and 1930, I operated a clandestine bootleg business in the nation's capital. I am here today to ensure that the spirit of temperance never returns to the city. No longer will I work in the shadows of the temperance regulations. For 16 years, the city was held back by the rules forced upon us by men who did not abide by them. I set up my own office in the House of Representatives and eventually moved it to the Senate office building. Never did I have trouble finding customers. In fact, my biggest problem was meeting the constant demand from congressmen and senators. <laughs> While my black book of buyers has been destroyed, I served most of the elected representatives during my time. Some of them I found were mighty good fellows, and others not so good. But I learned right off the bat that when it comes to eating, drinking, and having a good time in general, they are as human as other folks. My legacy lives on in Washington, D.C. today. While I hung up my hat after I was arrested in 1930, I worked with the Washington Post to expose my exploits on Capitol Hill as the man in the green hat. Today, my nickname serves as the inspiration for Green Hat Gin, the district's first distillery after Prohibition. Christian Heyrich summoned me here to speak of the, ills of, Pro of the ills of the Prohibition era in the hopes that the spirit of temperance will never return to DC. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to now invite Rachel Fitz, co-founder of Ancho Cidery, a fine cidery, to speak. <laughs> Hello. I have been called here today by the spirit of Christian Heyrich to help him complete this ritual. Specifically, Christian asked that I tell the tale of what happened when Christian tried to use his brewery while still abiding by prohibition rules. 
After the Shepherd Bone Dry Act was signed, but prior to its enforcement on October 31st, 1917, Christian decided to use the brewery systems to create a non-alcoholic fruity apple drink. Spending $100,000 on apples to be mass mashed and pasteurized, Christian created a new beverage at the brewery and called it Liberty Apple Champagne. Christian began to sell the drink, extolling its health-giving qualities. However, despite having cleaned the beer casks of yeast cells that had soaked into the wood, and despite his pasteurization of the apples, the drink fermented and was deemed too alcoholic to be sold. In 1920, the Treasury Department handed down a special ruling that allowed the brewery two weeks to dispose of its then-famous wine. Thousands of people came to the brewery building carrying kegs <laughs> and bottles to fill with Liberty Apple Champagne. They came by bicycle, carriage, and White House limousine <laughs> to purchase the drink being sold for a dollar a gallon. Christian kept the unsold alcohol in cask storage at the brewery. He refused to dilute the drink with water to reduce its alcohol content, and when prohibition was lifted in 1933, he was, only he was only permitted to resume making beer. The casks that held Liberty Apple Champagne were needed for beer, and with no legal method of disposing of the drink, which the government deemed a wine, he had to pour it into the sewers. Oh, no. On that day, 65,100 gallons were lost. <laughs> that is the equivalent of over one million glasses. Oh, my God. Sad. <laughs> the loss of such a delicious drink is unforgivable. As a cider maker, this incident haunts me. <laughs> so today I say no more. No more prohibition and no more temperance. I join Christian Heyrich to lay these spirits to rest. <laughs> Please rise <laughs> and join me in our prayer, which you'll find in your hymn. Our Lager, which, which art in Paris, hallowed be thy drink, that it will be drunk, I will be drunk, and all as it is in the tavern. Give us this day our foamy men, and forgive us our spillages. As we forgive those who still against us, and lead us not to incarceration, but deliver us from hangovers, for the knives, the beer, the bear, the lager, cross. Poor Danny Boy. The pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the roses falling. It's you, it's you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, for when the valley's hushed. And white with snow. It's I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. But when you come and all the flowers are dying, if I am dead, as dead I well may be, you'll come and find. The place where I am lying, and kneel and say an ave there for me, and I shall hear the soft you tread above me, and all my grave will warmer, sweeter be, for you will bend and tell me that you love me. And I shall sleep in peace until you come to me. Wow. Thank you, Michael. Does anyone?
anyone else have something to say? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Philly Sunday, and what you're doing here tonight is a mockery of all the work I have done throughout my life. Drink water, not whiskey, people. <laughs> I started off being a baseball player, for real. I played for the Chicago White Stockings, and then I found Jesus, and I became a tent revivalist, and then I became a Christian preacher. I argued for temperance to stop the flow of alcohol around this nation. As prohibition was enacted around the country, I traveled and hosted funerals for the spirit of alcoholism John Barleycorn, just as you are doing tonight, but in mockery of the work I've done around this country. Prohibition should still be the law of this land. I am a sworn, eternal, and uncompromising enemy of the liquor traffic. I have, I have been, and I will go on, fighting that damnable, dirty, rotten business with all the power at my command. I shall ask no quarter from that gang and shall get none from me. I challenge you to show whether the saloon has ever helped business, education, church morals, or anything we hold dear. Whiskey or beer are all right in their place, but their place is in hell. <laughs> The saloon has not one leg to stand on. It is the sum of all villainies. It is worse than war or pestilence. It is the crime of all crimes. It is the mother of crimes, sorry, it is the, cr the per parent of crimes and the mother of sins. <laughs> Do away with this cursed business and you will not have to put up to support them. Who gets the money, by the way? The saloon keepers and the brewers? <laughs> the distillers? <laughs> the cider makers? <laughs> While the, this whiskey fills our land with misery and poverty and wretchedness and diseases and death and damnation! Really? That is enough! <laughs> Get on the water wagon, people! Get on the water wagon! Get on that tomorrow morning. I would like to invite all of you, every last one, to please come forward for one last viewing of this solidarity before it is delivered unto the earth forever. Please come. Pay your respects. Thank <laughs> you. 